Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Genuine Chit Chat. This week, I am once again joined by Tony Farina. Now, if you didn't tune in last week, I implore you to go to last week's episode and check it out. Um, it explains sort of who Tony is in a little bit more detail and that sort of thing. Um, but if you don't fancy reading the description, I'll give you a very brief summary. Um, he's the Assistant Professor of Humanities at Siena Heights University. Um, I believe that's in Michigan in America. Um, he's also a reviewer of comic books for DC Comic News. Um, he also does a lot of audiobook reviews for Audible. Um, and also, one of the main reasons I sort of wanted to talk to him and things was because he was an early adopter of online education. So essentially he just teaches online courses to a lot of different people of different ages and we talk about it quite a lot in the last podcast and also in this one as well. So if that's something that interests you, just generally education, then that's definitely something this podcast is uh, going to be really sparking your interest in. Um, but also there's a couple of other things in this podcast we talk about. And one part we talk about is gender specific names and saying how like it's quite strange that names like, you know, Ashley um, and Alex, you know, generally if you have a male or female, it's quite normal. But if you have a name like Ben generally that's males but then you get other random ones like Elliot from Scrubs obviously that's a female name in Scrubs but I personally have met any Elliots who are female but um we speak about that a bit uh, we also talk about some of the different interpretations of the bible uh, I personally am not religious um I I don't believe me and Tony explicitly said what his religious ideology was, um, but we had a good, honest conversation about, you know, sort of interpretations of the Bible. Um, he's done a bit of religious studies, um, and so have I, so it was quite cool to have that little chat. And we then speak about Tony's time sort of doing women's studies and what that actually entails. Uh, speak about what Tony is actually studying at the moment. Um, he's got a thesis coming out and a, a book, or well, this thesis is a book. So we talk about all those sort of things. So, you know, he's a really, really interesting guy, and he's really passionate about what he talks about and... It's just a thrilling conversation. I had loads of fun talking to him. So I'm not really going to say much more about the podcast or start spoiling it. But, um, you know, as I said, it's a great chat. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And just before we get started, there'll be a quick promo for the Comics in Motion podcast. I played their promo last week, but it's because of them I basically got into contact with Tony. Um, and they're awesome dudes. And I think I said that I'm trying to sort out some sort of collaboration thing. Maybe them come on my show again or something like that uh, for the run up to Star Wars. So hopefully that'll be a thing that we're sort of planning in the background. So, you know, that's another reason to add their promo as well to help that but um yeah i think that's really it for me now guys um i'll be back at the end of the chat just to talk about what's sort of coming up and the other things i've got planned uh and do my usual rambly stuff um so be sure to like and subscribe in all the usual channels um you know instagram twitter and facebook sharing this show via word of mouth doing itunes reviews or reviews on any other site you use is always really appreciated and i really appreciate anyone listening and giving my little show a go so um thanks as always for tuning in guys and i'll talk to all of you at the end we are Comics in Motion. I'm Dave, the comic nerd. And I'm Chris, the TV and movie geek. You can download our show from your favourite podcast catcher. We review TV shows and movies that are based on comic books. So if you can come along and join in the fun, that'd be super. Welcome to Genuine Chit Chat, where we have honest conversations with interesting people. And I'm your host, Mike Burton. So I just think it's a different level of engagement. And because while I'm chatty, I really do like being by myself. I'm okay with that. Like I, I'm, I'm not, I was in a punk band in college. I'm not afraid to be in front of people. I could stand in front of a room and lecture, but I'm okay being alone. And so I think that's part of it too. Not everybody is. So it takes the right kind of person. But I feel my connection with my students, I know my students better now having never seen their faces than I think I did some having spent, you know, 30 hours with them in a, in a classroom somewhere. It's interesting you say that with the, the, the faces part, because in a sense, that's almost, it's almost more true in, in, in a weird way. It's almost, uh, for lack of a better word, pure. It, it's like when the the body you know we are all brains at the end of the day that's actually what we are and then we're in side a skull and that's you know within skin organs or the sort of tomfoolery you know i don't choose my face you know i'm very fortunate that my parents were both averagely too good looking and i turned out okay you know right. i've got funny colored facial hair which is a talking point and apart from that it's I don't have any, you know, I don't have any facial deformities. I don't have any sort of disabilities or anything that are very obvious, you know, things like that. And I'm very lucky that I don't have those things because, you know, there's people who, I don't, I hate saying this word, the word ugly, but there are some people who are born and they 
if some loads of people would look at them and their first thought is you're ugly and it's a horrible thing to think and unfortunately there are some people who are like that and i hate saying it because it makes me feel uncomfortable even thinking it but there are some people who are like that and they have to try so much harder in one way or another you know you get some people who will i'm not just talking about ugly people i'm just talking about you know this you people the first taste people get of you is by looking at you okay and now a certain percentage of that is you know my hairstyle is generally the way it is because I choose to get a haircut and yeah, you know, my facial hair is because I can grow facial hair and right. I, very, it's very rare for guys to, who ha- can grow facial hair who don't I've noticed that quite a lot it's normally guys who are clean shaven and are quite patchy so superior there but apart from that it's like you know it's and you've got it as well I can see it I do so yeah exactly so it's like a lot there's loads of little tweaks you can do you know obviously women and now more so accepted men can put on makeup but generally speaking unless you go mental cosmetic surgery your face is what your face is you can't really do that much you can tweak it but you can't change it but the problem is is that people will see your face and they will a lot of the time judge you and then they make a judgment call about you and then they will somehow make everything you do a link to that in the wrong way you know they see you as they see you as ugly and then they treat you like you're ugly you respond badly because they're treating you ugly and they're like, yeah just of course because you're ugly so you you act ugly you know it's that sort of uh negative feedback loop sort of thing and yeah and it's, sure whereas when you're online a lot of people can just be true like no one's worrying about you know me right now i'm basically wearing pajamas because that's when i'm the most comfortable in at all i'm always doing podcasts well, it's also jobs. what god nine o'clock there uh it is nine o'clock here yeah, yeah but i don't so. normally get to sleep till midnight but you know oh, okay as, as soon as i get home it's like pajamas like that I, I so much more comfort than style and if anyone sees me on instagram or anything like that they can tell but it's uh i i, I want to be comfortable so when i chat with people on the podcast i don't have to worry as much about how i look or anything uh that much but i don't have that burden of thinking oh i've got you know a growth on my face i've got a scar on my face i've got this i've got that so when it's just online and you don't have to see them they can just be like this is my idea i can show you as much or as little of myself as i want but in doing that what most people don't realize and it's something i've said before is a lot of the time you can tell the most about someone by what they don't say as opposed to what they do say and it's that kind of thing where you can get a true insight into how someone is. And obviously, if they're online and they, you know, they're doing an online course and they're trying to better themselves in some way, usually it will uh, filter out a certain amount of uh, unpleasant people in a lot of ways. But they, it takes away, as you say, the introvert and extrovert thing, which I, that is a really good point as well I hadn't thought of, is, yeah, you take out social anxiety, you take out worrying that people have to wear something specific or go into this room full of people and worrying about asking questions and also being judged socially and then this affecting the social circles around you and everyone you care about and then people are whispering about you in the halls and, you know, social things. It's It takes so much more of that stress away and that must be... You must notice that yourself from uh, being teaching in classrooms to then you kind of get this um, uh, like a, a layer taken off in a sense. Like yeah, a- absolutely. And and the funny thing is, is the the program that we use now does allow people to put and it's maybe the size I don't know of a quarter on the. Mm. I guess I could blow it up on the on the screen. Um, it's just a little icon. You can make it your avatar, whatever you want. Some people put a picture of their dog. Some people leave it just a blank. You know. Mm not a picture at all, just like a <laughs> silhouette. Um, mine is actually in black and white. It's These are my computer glasses. That's why I have them on so I can see you. Um, I don't need them to drive or anything, but since that's how I'm... At, so I, I have this hat. Um, it's a ball cap and it says, ha- it says facts matter on the front. Hashtag Amazing. facts matter. So I put the hat down real low. And so all they can see is like the top of my glasses and that hat. And it's in black and white and it's a zoom in real close. And that's my, that's my avatar. Um, the idea being it doesn't matter. Like, that's how I want you to know. This is a class where facts matter. That's what I care about. I care about you being honest and telling me what you need to say, speak your truth and write your truth, and I'm going to tell you mine, and that's how it's going to be. And so, but I have some people who put, like I have a a gal who um, is getting married, so she had her wedding picture up there. That's awesome. You share what you want to share, and it's irrelevant. Um, People, I don't require them to post pictures of themselves, but some people do. Some people absolutely will post pictures of themselves um, in other, like in that we have a thing called the cyber cafe where you introduce yourself. Some people will attach other pictures in there, but generally they don't. And yeah, it, it's just a place where you get to present yourself 100% how you want. You can pick and choose if you want to 
put a Snapchat filter on there and have yourself look like a hyena. You could do whatever you want. And, uh, and it does it. That's gone. All you see is a name. And the name, the interesting thing about names is you and I, I mean, your name is Mike. My name is, you know, Anthony, Tony. Um, in general, that's a gendered name, both cases. Now, obviously in Europe, Tony, Tony with a man is generally spelled with an I. So if you see T-O-N-I, you're not sure. If you see a T-O-N-Y, like the way I spell it, you probably know it's a man. But there's two-way names. Um, my wife's family is full of them. Um, you know, you don't know. You see that name. What is that? What is that name? Like, uh, we were just watching an American football game. Uh, there's a team called the Houston Texans, and they have a linebacker. His name is Whitney Merciless. Merciless, which is a great name. That is amazing. Football. But his name is Whitney, which in this country isn't a man's name anymore. Hmm. Very, very rarely. And so, you know, if he were in my class and he didn't put a picture of himself, there would be plenty of people. His name would be the only marker, and people would think Whitney's a woman. That's the only thing that I think doesn't come through as clearly is, is that person a man? Is that person a woman? Is that person binary? Is that person trans? You don't know if that person outs him or herself, then you know. Um, but other than that, I think it's really relaxed and I get a way truer sense of people uh, that I think they overshare by week eight. We do eight week terms instead of 16 week terms. We do eight week terms. So we do two, eight weeks. So it's like a, it's called accelerated. So we're doing 16 weeks of work in eight weeks. So week one or two, you know, if it's your first class, the real tentative, but but why week eight, they're sharing all kinds of crazy stuff with each other, right in discussion, just out in the open. I mean, I've had people tell me all kinds of personal stuff that isn't just to me, not like sending me an email, like, oh, Tony, I'm sorry, I didn't get my paper in, my house flooded. It's in discussion, here's this thing about my dad and, and, you know, sharing that story or here's this thing about my kids are doing and it's they would never do that in a classroom Hmm. i get to know them so well and they're then more open to learn and it becomes a different community because you trust those people you trust those names on the screen so much more than you would if you know whitney merciless sitting in the room is not this six foot six giant linebacker just another guy you know you don't know so everything goes away and it really is you know, you asked and I didn't answer it and I wasn't trying to avoid it. Would I ever go back and, and teach in a classroom again? And you actually used the word lecture, which that was part of the thing I didn't like hmm. uh, was lecturing. Uh, uh, and I don't have to do that. I record my lectures. So it's like an inverted classroom. So all my lectures are recorded. I have a 15 minute. We use American APA for our citations. I have a 15 minute video, APA, the basics. They can watch it as many times as they want. Anytime I need to do a new grammar thing or here's how you paraphrase. I work out the video, I record it, it's done. I work, you know, I rework those maybe every year to make sure they're up to date. But then I'm just engaged with the students. In a classroom, mm-hmm. again, you've only got three hours. I spend a third of the time standing up in front of them giving a lecture. That's not engaging at all. So I don't miss that. I don't miss the just standing there and making them fall asleep as you <laughs> <laughs> as you described. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was not the best student, but <laughs> It's- I had a student, I had a teacher in undergrad, somebody fell asleep in class. Uh, and when we were leaving, she left him in there <laughs> and, uh, and we were leaving with her and we're like, Dr. Lamb, doesn't that make you mad? And her, this cleared it up. She's like, cause it was just, I went to a small private school, like the one where I teach. And she said, um, I don't know how much it costs to go here. That kid's not on scholarship. His parents, <laughs> I know his parents, he can sleep. Like, that's how she felt. She's like, if he and his parents want to pay for him to take a nap in my class, I don't care if he fails. It was like such an interesting, that right to try versus that right to succeed. You know, she's saying, look, he's, he is privileged. His parents can write a check and send him here. And he wants to sleep through it. And you guys, the ones who are walking out with me are on scholarship and you took out loans and you did all this stuff. So I'd rather be with the people who want to be here. And, you know, it was just such a fascinating look at, at that. Um, you know, that idea of that, but she was, I, I never fell asleep in her class. She was always really engaging. So, but yeah. you know, I mean, you, we all know there's bad instructors. There's, I can't promise if I have to stand up and give an hour long lecture about symbolism, that's going to be boring after a while. 
Mm. I think it's, it's, it's especially with like the uh, instant instant gratification culture, uh, as it were. You know, every piece of information, relatively speaking, ever at your fingertips. It, when you're then just fed information for hours, like you know, I'm a huge podcast fan. I, I mentioned I love Rogan's podcast. They're normally like three hours long. Well, I, I don't sit there and have three hours of a podcast that evening. I listen to it in like somewhere between five and an hour, five minutes and an hour long snippets, depending if. I have a car ride or if I'm doing the, if I'm, you know, uh, doing chores, I'm just washing the dishes and it takes, you know, 10, 15 minutes. I'll just pop it on. I don't remember 90% of what's said in those conversations, but I pick up little bits of information. It's entertaining and I learn little bits from it and stuff. But I was thinking with, um, I was going to mention the name thing as well. You've said so many great things I could jump Sorry. off the topics. How dare you be interesting, Tony? It's not fair. <laughs> if only you had a one track mind and then it would be so easy to think. Sorry. Of things, but I'm thinking of loads of things at once. Um, I was going to say, uh, I'll say two things, okay? The first one is just a small point, which is the good thing is the online course uh, is with one thing as well that you kind of mentioned that I half touched on before was with your brain power, you have to use whatever amount to listen. And, you know, more of that is to process it. You know, you can hear stuff and then there's listening and then there's processing and there's thinking about and kind of working out and organizing in your own mind. And then there's also, if you're in a class, even if like I'm, it's pretty, people can probably tell if they've listened to the show before uh, and you can tell by probably the way of acting is I'm an extrovert I'm very much you know if I could sing I would be a singer I would be standing on a stage I mean thank everyone must be so happy I'm not because I would man my ego would have gone through the roof if I was a teen <laughs> I was, I was a good thing I was really overweight and not good looking when I was a teenager as well because if I was good looking a great singer and super smart man I pff, I would not want to know where I ended up I'm glad I got down Jared Leto uh, yes well yeah my mate always talks about Jared Leto he's like I love his music and he's got the best voice ever but he's such a dick <laughs> it's like that's it like that's who it sounded like you were describing i'm not i'm not saying yeah well i i, I don't have any strong weeks for or against jared yeah. i mean i think his music's cool and he's an all right actor at times but pff, you know but it's um with in a class you know there's a thing i only just really thought of which is even being an extrovert and i don't have a lot of the insecurities or worries and things i have quite i rationalize it quite easy which is like well if people hate me for who i am then i don't want the kind of person to be have i don't care about their opinion in in, in a sense like a, it's a very simple way of looking at it but yeah, that's how i kind of got through um a lot of people hating me while i was in school so with me even i think that when i'm in class or you know i was a uh, forum yesterday like uh, about autonomous vehicles and stuff you know the future of cars and fraud and these sorts of things and um, I was asking a lot of questions because I always do and I'm always curious and but there were certain points where I was like oh I'm not going to ask that question because I just asked like three questions and even if this fourth question is more important to me I don't want to seem like to all these strangers I'm never going to meet again that I'm constantly I'm asking questions it's getting near lunchtime it's already running a little bit late I don't want to be the guy who holds everyone back to make them 20 minutes later and then later on when they have to drive three hours to get home after this you know autonomous vehicle uh, thing that they're thinking oh that guy he just wouldn't shut up in class but if if this like I've got the contact details of some of the people so I will be berating them with questions uh, <laughs> but you know they don't escape everyone else does but even me who doesn't have social anxiety um, I a part of my brain is always on it, at least in the background, thinking, right, but you know, you can't say this, you can't say that, you have to make sure you do this, you have to, you, you, there's that checker, that, that, there is that filter, and that in itself takes up brain power as well as everything else. And like, for people who are introverts, that must be exhausting trying to learn while also thinking, if you, like, I've got a couple of mates who have got quite bad social anxiety, and they really don't like, even they love music, but they don't like going to gigs because all the people and et cetera. And it's like, they have to really. Uh, my my mate, um, one of my mates actually described it perfectly. Um, he's one of the ones I know who've got the probably the first person I met who has really quite bad social anxiety. And he was like, he's like, I do like going to gigs, or I do like you know have going to parties or whatever. But he says the thing is, is that the amount of effort that it takes to actually be comfortable. I have to. It takes me, you know hours of getting in my mind thinking everything's gonna be fine nothing's gonna go wrong and then you get there and then it takes an hour to get used to being in this new environment and then while you're talking to people you're still thinking about all this stuff and it's like that must be insanely hard like and that and the other little thing i want to tack on was um just names i was saying the other day actually it's really weird that names are actually androgynous but then right not- it's like, you know, I mean, it's like a table, or it's a bad example because in every language, I think apart from English, they have masculine and feminine things. But like, you know, you have, one example I use is the TV show Scrubs. 
th- there's a girl mm-hmm. in that called Elliot. Elliot, when I, yeah. yeah, when I saw that show, I was like, why is that girl called Elliot? That doesn't make sense. And then I met more Alex's and more Ashley's and more Charlie's and more, you know, and then, you know, I've seen a couple of Leslie's who are guys as well. And it's like, I remember saying to someone, I was like, what makes a girl name a girl name? And what makes it a guy name? Like, it's, it's not, a, I mean, one could argue, you know, you've got the macho in air quotes names, like just quick, easy, like Ben, Dave, John. But it's like, why... It, they're just mouth noises like why is this mouth noise if everyone's saying gender doesn't really matter anymore some people are saying it does some people are saying it doesn't it doesn't you know who you are as a gender doesn't affect your personality in most senses every person should be treated as an individual regardless of gender race you know etc but so it's like so why should a name have to be gender related like yeah i don't know it, it shouldn't you're absolutely right and that's the thing so there's there's definitely times where, you know, I'll be unsure, I'll see a name, and I won't be sure because it's a two-way name. And it's funny, you mentioned Ashley, where in this country, Ashley is a, more of a female name okay. um, than, and then over there. And it's, you know, and in Evil Dead, uh, in the <laughs> Army of Darkness, you know, Bruce, Love that. his name is Ashley. And it was just always an interesting thing. It was it's probably one of the last um, pop culture references of a man in America called Ashley is probably from, that, that I can think of. Is that is that, and then you know the show Ash versus the Evil Dead was just recently on, and that's Love that. lived forever. Um, another Michigan native, Bruce Campbell. So I'll just my brother calls uh, him Juicy Brucey. <laughs> <laughs> He's something else. That guy. He's great, but, I love uh, him. but yeah, no, it is a it is a fascinating thing, and you know you're right. Names aren't uh, every every name is a two way name now. They they all no names mean anything. Um, you know, I grew up a comic book nerd, so Logan was Wolverine. Mm, yeah, and then but I know. Um, you know, I know plenty of women or girls, more, more girls than women, but girls now, you know, like between age like 10 and 15, like, or even in their early twenties who went to school with my kids or, or students of mine who have younger kids who are called Logan, um, that are girls. And that just happened. And I don't know when it happened, but it doesn't really matter. It's just, you make that choice. Um, that's your name. Um, you're, you're right. And it shouldn't matter. It absolutely doesn't. But that is, that's what I'm saying though. That is the, I notice in an online environment, that's really the last bastion of that is the name. People see the name and they make an assumption, um, you know, of that. But you think, like you said, men called like Leslie Nielsen is a, an American yeah, exactly. treasure, right? Yeah. And, um, you don't think twice about that. No. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but it, you know, most, but, most people associate that as a, as a female name, but, um, yeah, it takes one though. It's, it just takes one famous person. Or it, it doesn't have to be famous necessarily, yeah. but you know, one person who's famous, like as one an, person an, of an renown. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and jumping off that, I, I did want to ask before we go on another tangent because I keep forgetting yeah. to ask you about it. Women's studies, like, yeah, what is that about? And before I ask, let you answer that question, I'm going to ask a quick thing, which is linking in with what you did with the religious studies thing and the person who said uh, reading into the bible someone um uh, someone i used to know from college who was uh, religious but then became more agnostic and stuff spoke about the bible one thing that she actually said to me which i hadn't thought of until that point was that line in the bible obviously is very much more famous over there than over here which is you know uh, a man shouldn't lay with another man as he would with a woman and you know a lot of people would say that means you shouldn't be gay blah rubbish um but one thing that she said to me is something that certain scholars have uh, looked at from that is actually that in those times, women were valued as lesser uh, individuals than men. So it's actually, don't treat a man like you would treat a woman because men are better than women. And that's a really interesting way of kind of counter-arguing that whole, even if someone believes everything in the Bible and you want to hate gays for that stupid reason, there's no reason you should ever hate gays. But, you know, I, I want to ask, did that get mentioned at all? It and did. From, it did. It, Wonderful. It did. I want to but hear about di- that. But in a different way. It's uh, funny. Um well, it's interesting that line in particular. So, um, the, and again, I'm not the scholar. So I took <laughs> a few religious studies classes. Um, and then because I took the second religious studies class I took or third was that gender and biblical interpretation. And that, that led me to this other path, um, of the women's studies. Cause I found that more fascinating, um, than just the straight religious studies. Cause I thought religious studies was going to be, I'm going to study Taoism and Hinduism and the, you know, and the Quran. Um, uh, what it ended up being because my school was a was a like the the the, the freshman dorm where I lived um, was called Wesley Hall. You know, we're method. It's a Methodist school, so religious studies there. The the intro to religious studies guy and then the this gal April. They were like the unicorns. Um, the rest of it was like we're going to study Christian theology and 
not even the Old Testament. We're just going to focus on. So that was that was less interesting to me because I wanted to study religion, world religion, and that's mm, what I yeah. thought religious studies would be. And that's fine, you know. Different different schools can do it their own way. But so anyway, that line in particular. So I'm I am by no means an expert. Disclaimer. But um, the interesting thing about that whole thing is that what what April said was the, all of that was written by Paul. The whole um, hatred of gay people came from Paul, um, right? Or interpretations of what Paul said. And the interesting thing about Paul is, of course, he wasn't a believer, right? He was Saul. He meets Jesus after Jesus is dead, right? The, the spirit of Jesus comes to him and he becomes Paul. And he becomes like the biggest writer of the New Testament after the Gospels is Paul. And Paul was really, truly like, he was the one who pushed that agenda. Um, and so her argument, one could argue, and she really looked at it, it was gender and biblical interpretation. And that's the biggest thing for her was, we're not reading this in its original language, so it's all interpretation. Um, you can be the most faithful, devout Christian, and good for you if you are, but if you're not reading it in its original language, you're reading an interpretation. There's nothing you can do about that. One of my favorite books of all time, one of the greatest, no I mean, the greatest novel, in my opinion, is the first novel, which is Don Quixote, and I don't read Spanish. So I've only ever relied on translations of it. My love of a book is probably wrong. Everything that I love about Don Quixote, I have several copies of it hidden around the house. Some are more prominent. Some are like digital copies of it. I love that book. But they're different because they're different interpretations. So she focused on that. So what you're saying, your interpretation of it could be totally accurate. Her argument was he was really... Um, you know, a lot of it comes from what you're saying. He was very like pro man and men are supposed to be um, the leaders of the community and women were lesser than. Um, and she also argued that Paul suggested that um, men in order to resist temptation of being with a man or with like Paul's the reason that priests in the Catholic church are celibate. That was him. Right. And so he just had this whole disdain for women. So you could argue that he hated women or you could argue that he actually really liked men and that was his way to to um, to you know keep himself from that was by wrapping himself up in his faith, and that was his way to stop him from something that people at the time thought were unclean. It's kind of like was it just a couple of days ago there was one of these big gay conversion assholes is gay, mm, like in a, it's like spent twenty years doing this horrific thing to people, and now he's out. Oh, so all yeah. the damage and horrific things that you've caused for twenty years because now. Well, right, we knew. Um, so that was always her interpretation that maybe it was a me thinks he doth protest too much situation mm, with yeah. Paul. So, but again, just an interpretation. If it, uh, the odds that April DeConnick hears this and is like, you totally misrepresent. If she hears <laughs> this and says, I totally misrepresented her, she should come on the show because that would be fascinating. She I would love, I'd love to talk to someone about uh, religiosity and things. I think religion could be because interesting. Because she, like I said, she made us read the... Uh, the Gnostic Gospels, which I didn't even know were a thing until then. I, I didn't know they were a thing. I it's know about the sea, scroll, the sea Scrolls I've heard of vaguely, and I know there's like, uh, there's the Abrahamic religions that I've, my knowledge of them kind of mixed up a little bit, you know, because you've got like, you know, the Judeo Christians and, the, you know, Ju Judaism and yeah. Christians and then Catholicism and then you've got Mormons and then, you, you know. And those are all Christian. Yeah, those are yeah. all different. Other than Judaism, those are all forms of Christianity. Exactly. And then you've yeah. got obviously the other Abrahamic religions, you know, the Quran is Abrahamic. They mention course, Jesus yeah. in the Quran, but they just don't think that he's as much of a prophet as Muhammad. But then right. he Jewish was just people the don't prophet, think he before Muhammad. Exactly. So it's like yeah. all these, they all kind of link together in, in some way. Some sort of, I almost think of every religion is like a puzzle piece to the story of the great universe. In my opinion, I just feel like science has more of the, the puzzle pieces, but that doesn't mean that religion's not valuable. But um, with, uh, with your women's studies then, so sure. what, what did you, what is women's studies? You know, yeah, it's generally. an interdisciplinary study. Hmm. So I, it, it's, it's, and what it's is inter it, disciplinary interdisciplinary. Sorry. So essentially we, we call it where I teach, we call it multidisciplinary. And essentially the idea is there are things that don't fit. We talked before about having a major. I can say I'm an English major and you're like, Oh, you read, you write. You're right. That's what I do. I read, I write. I think about reading. I think about writing. That's my job. I teach mostly writing, but I teach a lot of, you know, um, thinking and critical thought too. But you're an accountant. There's some degrees that are just things. 
but but there are subjects that cross over. So women's studies, I, here are the courses that I took. So we took an intro to women's studies class. Like at my university, you're required to take a fine arts course and a humanities course. So my fine arts course was this art history course, which I ended up loving. Uh, but it focused mostly on, uh, and I took up a few other art history courses too, just for fun, because I am I like that stuff. But um, so one of the classes I took though was focusing on female artists. So you're Willa Cath, or you're... Um, you're, uh, yeah, no, she was a writer. Um, Georgia O'Keeffe, you're Mary Cassatz, you know, like the big, the big names of female, and there were other ones, of course, um, that we'd study. So that, so I just took that. And then we took, I took this intro to women's studies class and it was essentially dealing with like feminist theory and the, the idea of where does, where does this word feminism from, where does it come? And interestingly enough, we started with Mary, Mary Shelley's uh, mom, Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Women. So think about when that was. Think about who Mary Shelley is. She wrote Frankenstein. So before her, her mom wrote this thing called Vindication of the Rights of Women. And it's a mind blower to think how old that is. Hmm. Um, and we would read like uh, Sojourner Truth, who was, a, who was a, uh, an escaped slave in America, who was a suffragette and an abolitionist, because right. you know she's, she's both things. Yeah. And so we, it was like, we just kind of studied the history of when we read some Ursula K. Le Guin. Do you, you know her, the writer? I'm afraid don't know. Um, so just a little bit of everything, you know, whatever, here's some Jane Austen, you know, here's some of this, some of that. And, you know, and, you know, not all these women necessarily consider themselves feminists, but they are part of the feminist movement. So you just kind of learn like the history of, of women's rights and suffrage and just feminist theory is this concept of, you know, what does that even mean? So then you would take like a history class. So I took, uh, I took a gay and lesbian lit course, which counted too, which I found interesting because that wasn't just about female writers, but it counted um, towards women's studies. I took this gender and biblical interpretation class. There was a human sexuality anthropology class that counted. Um, you know, just like learning things about the world. And so then all I needed was this feminist theory class at the end. So I was pulling from anthro and from literature and from art and from social science and, and religion. And so then they're like, oh, so it's an interdisciplinary degree. And then so the feminist theory, which is, you can look at it, from any perspective, the best way to describe like a literary theory, you know, there's all kinds, there's Marx's, Marx's theory, there's, um, uh, you know, there's a reader response theory. When you're studying literature, it's like a frame, you hold up a picture frame over whatever it is you're looking at and you're saying, I only can see this. So feminist theory is how are the women treated? How are the women represented? What is it saying about women in whatever it is you're reading? Mm -hmm. Then you could move the feminist theory and you could come in and go, well, I'm going to do deconstructionism on the exact same piece. So we, I took a feminist theory class where essentially all we did for 15 weeks was study art, literature, music through the feminist lens. Mm -hmm. And then I had to write a paper and do an intern, you know, like do a, do an internship. I don't I actually don't even remember where I did that. <laughs> um, that's the one piece I don't remember. Cause that was just like a practical thing where you'd go and like work at a, like a women's shelter or something like that. Um, so it, it's really truly like a jackknife or uh, or not a jackknife, like a Swiss army knife degree where you just learn a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And so it works out perfectly because I'm the multidisciplinary studies coordinator at my school. So I'm the person who's like trying to get people from a crop, but we just call it MDS, but women's studies was its own thing. Um, It still is at that university, at that college, Albion college, but some places have it. A university of Michigan actually has, has some of the, like we read books that were written by people who teach there. Mm, oh, um, wow. Yeah. It, so it, it's, that's the best explanation is you just learn <laughs> a little bit about everything. And it was just fascinating because again, I just liked all those things. And so the minor just, I didn't set out to actively do it. But then when I realized that I only had to take this one more class and I'd have a minor, that was really kind of indicative of the learning that I had at my, at my college, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So it really worked out well. Um, and what do you see? So you, obviously, um, I can't remember if, if you said this on air or off air, but um, you got a thesis, and it's basically going to be a, a, a novel, essentially. Oh um, yeah, yeah. And so I'm, ask, I'm getting it. I'm getting so a master's of fine arts in. Creative that's what I was going to ask. Right what now. it is now? Yeah. So what? You, so you're learning uh, fine arts. Is that what the, your current qualification pursuit my cur- is? So my first master's degree was in education, focusing mm-hmm. on teaching adult learners, which is what I do. So I have an English undergrad. Then I have a first a master's degree with a master's of education. So just a teaching you know, not certified, but to be able to teach adult learners. Um, I focused on adult learners and like reading, you know, adult reading and writing, that kind of thing. And then now I'm getting this other degree. So 
a master's of, of education isn't considered a terminal degree. So a terminal degree is a doctorate or a fine arts degree. So um, the fi- a master of fine arts is in creative writing. So you can get a master of fine arts in, you know, in art history. You can get a master of fine arts in ceramics. I'm getting a master's of fine arts in creative writing. And so that is that I'm writing a novel for that. So are you doing that because like where – where do you want to go as a, from here? I mean, obviously you're oh. already teaching an online class. You've got a novel that you'll be coming out along with your hopefully qualification and things. So, so yeah. where where do you want – is this a jumping off point? Are you just basically following passions that you think are – I really is. like this. Yeah, my, ki- my children are adults. We're empty nesters. We had our kids – my wife and I didn't have any kids together. We had – she had three, I had two. We merged our, ki- merged our families. They're all adults out in the world. Um, it's just us. And uh, – but we're still in our 40s. And so uh, – we can do things that like this. And it's not that I couldn't do it before. I mean, I got my first master's when my kids were young and my wife got her library degree, which is also a master's degree when the kids were in the middle, middle, middle to young, you know, middle, (laughs) middle, some of them were teens. Some of them were still single digits during that time. But, you know, so it's doable. Uh, But the master of fine arts was never really the most practical degree at the time. It, It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of attention. And not to say that the master of education didn't, but that was more class-based. You'd go to class, you'd sit in class, you'd do your stuff, you'd write your papers, you write your thesis. I wrote a thesis about invitational education, which is, you know, about like asking students what they want to learn and trying to cater to them. Hmm. It was, it was, you know, I just wrote a paper, a big paper about it, really. But this was always something I would have wanted to do, but it just really wasn't practical at the time when my kids were little. Uh, So this is something I want to do. And I've been teaching now for, well, since I was 21 years old. So I've been teaching for 25 years. Wow. And, and I needed to remember what it was like to be a student. And I'm naturally curious. I want to do more things. And I could have gotten a doctorate of education. I could have done that. I actually got accepted into a program. I applied uh, to it. I got accepted. Um, Some things didn't work out and I'm actually glad. So then um, my, where I work and there's a thing called, there's national accrediting bodies around the United States, and uh, they want you to have a terminal degree or experience. Well, because of the amount of experience I have teaching, I don't need a terminal degree, but it looks better for the university if I have one. So, um, but it, that, that's not, they, nobody asked me to do this. Hmm. This was my choice to do it. Um, in fact, very few people actually know. So I'm, now that I've said it, I'll, I'll be telling more people that I'm almost <laughs> done with it. Um, yeah, so it's it's one of those situations where I'm doing it because I've been writing stories since I was 12 years old, and I wrote that play, and I'm always writing. But it's, it's almost like you need to have a focus, right? You need to have, sometimes you need a kick to do it. And now I've gotten where I am now, that muscle is flexed, so I know when to write. I know how to write. I know how to take 20 minutes of my day and write a page. Um, I know that if I don't get the whole story done in the first draft, that's okay. Those kinds of things where, you know, writing is hard. Writing takes time. And when you have a full-time job and everything, it's, it's really easy to make excuses. Yeah. Oh, but you know, that, that soccer match is on. I don't, (laughs) you know, which I still want to do. I still want to watch that soccer match, but I can watch that on replay. You know, that's mm. where technology is great. <laughs> I can just go watch it on demand, just avoid the sports page and go watch it later. So yeah, so there's no end game other than I wanted to write this book. Uh, I've had the idea for years. Um, my wife and I were actually laying on a beach and I was like, you know what? And I told her this premise, like if this were us, this is what we would do. And then she said, oh, that'd be funny. And because uh, the premise of the book is, the, the matriarch of the family has died and she was rich and the kids didn't know. And that's what I said to my wife. It was just the two of us when we laid on the beach and I just said, man, if we were rich, we wouldn't tell the kids. <laughs> she was like, yeah. You know, and then they'd find out later. So like we keep the money from them, but we just, yeah. like you were saying earlier, you know, about struggle. Yeah. You know, cause we both want to work. She's a librarian. I'm a teacher. These are things we want to do. So um, we wouldn't want them to think they could, they could stop at 16. Oh, you guys are rich. It doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. yeah 100%. And so that's the premise that there's the, like working class family from Indianapolis and their parents are dead and the kids now discover they're rich, hmm. but there's like, there's, um, 
but they're a broken family and they're all kind of forced to come back together and deal with each other. And yeah. That's the book. So it's just like family drama. It's like, it's not heavy. It's not heavy lifting in any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Um, it, but so it's just a story I thought would be interesting to tell. And the challenging thing is I'm telling it from the perspective of, of every character speaks in first person present tense. Hmm. So you switch from, from this person to this person, this is a, you know, a 35 year old man and this is a 40 year old woman and this is a 17 year old girl. And they're all talking, they're all telling their version of the story in real time and they don't overlap. Hmm. So to move from scene A to scene B, I have to move from this guy talking to this girl talking. And I have to like, in my brain, take his brain out and then put her brain in because I'm speaking as her. Yeah. So it's, it's just been a challenge. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been fun. It's, you know, first world problems. It's, I'm not digging a ditch. I'm just, <laughs> a book. but it's, it is fun. And uh, I mean, my hope is that people will like it. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's what you can do is having a passion project. But um, have you seen the film uh, Royal Tenenbaums? I have. Yeah, I, I, Wes Anderson. He's the director. He's one of my favorite yeah. directors. I, I just yeah, my, that's what yeah. I thought of. Yeah, that, that's a, that's one of the things. It's I, funny. I, I didn't think that. You know, it's interesting what it is, and I didn't realize it. I mean, the characters have literary names. I'm a book person. I, I'm a book nerd all the way since my whole life, and um, the characters have like literary names because I'm kind of writing an American novel, and yeah. so they the characters their parents name them after American writers, not after uh, American characters. And so there's a book by William Faulkner, and I'm not a Faulkner fan, so I've now made Faulkner at people angry, and I <laughs> made Jared Leto mad if he's listening. Um, he was great in that Blade Runner movie, though. I have to say, <laughs> he was. I would, that was a was amazing movie. in that. Yeah. That. Um, I feel like, but I still feel like they just showed up at his house and he was dressed like that, and they're like, "Good, <laughs> let's film this. Let's yeah. you wear that to work today." That's how I. I don't know him at all, but that was my thing. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, uh, so there's a book by William Faulkner called As I Lay Dying. And this is the plot. The mom is dead and the family, these like kind of hill, hill folk from Mississippi in Mississippi have to take their mom to where they're going to bury her. And, and you roll through their, their versions of this trek. So uh, it's kind of that, you know, because at the end, the story is called The Will. At the end, you'll, and, and pieces throughout, you hear snippets of stories from the mother being told. Um, so, and then As I Lay Dying, there's one scene from the mother's perspective. So I'm, I'm kind of lifting that, yeah. um, that structure. It's not, it's going to be longer than that and um, less, less self-loathing. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't hate myself like Faulkner did. Um, <laughs> the, it takes place in the Midwest, which is where I'm from. And it's not a, it's, you know, the, the, some of the characters aren't excited to be back, but there's not like a genuine hatred of it. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, Faulkner, everything he wrote, he hated everything about Mississippi, which is where he was from. So but anyway, that's the idea. So it's just something to something to keep pushing myself. And uh, you no, know, I'm only you know I'm only 46. So hopefully, maybe 20 years from now, I'll go get another. I'll get that doctorate later. Yeah. You know, I just want to keep learning. And and I can you know you can do the goodwill hunting thing. You know, it's like you're going to spend hundred thousand dollars on something you can learn from a dollar fifty and finds from the public library. Totally true. Love the public library. My wife is a librarian. I'm pro library, but. I also think sometimes the structured education helps you to motivate yourself. Yeah. I, could I have sit and written this novel? Yes. Would I have? Probably not. Mm, yeah. Right. You know, whatever your motivation is. So, so there's no end game. I don't plan on leaving where I work. I plan on continuing doing what I'm doing. I'm uh, a, a colleague of mine who has an MFA already. She and I have discussed creating an MFA program at our university, which is totally online. The way that I do it now, it's low res. So three times a year, I have to go to Colorado and spend a week there through, you know, on campus doing stuff. And that is prohibitive. That's, that's costly too. So there's some people who just, who can't do that kind of program. So I would love to, there's not a lot of totally online MFAs. So that's maybe something we would do is see if we can convince our university to do that. But for now, it's a totally selfish endeavor. <laughs> well i mean that's great i mean it's, it's a passion project i mean that's, yes that, that's what you yeah. want to do isn't it it's like you know one of the reasons i have this podcast is you know fingers crossed in 10 years if i'm still doing it in 10 years 
I will have enough supporters to have a Patreon page for have people to be able to support me so I could do this full time. That's the dream. That's not realistic. I, I doubt that's going to happen. I would love for that to happen, but I'm not like, yes, th- this is what, this is my future. This is what I know I'm going to, it's like, I have to be realistic. This is something I spend a lot of my time on and I find that there are certain days, and I've said the podcast before, and I hope people don't feel like I'm being very negative on the podcast, but it's like, I do have certain days. I do all my editing on Sundays, um, usually, and, you know, Sunday takes about four hours from this raw chat to release part yeah. one. It's, you know, I make I do the artwork and Photoshop. I do promotional uh, stuff to put on Instagram. I make an audio snippet to put on Instagram. I write all the description, the hashtags, the normal tags, you know, uh, linked people's websites and etc. I have to listen to the show back and write appropriate notes about it. I have to do intro and outro. All this sort of stuff and edit it to make sure, you know, when I clear my throat and cough a thousand times. Uh, that I, didn't, I, don't... I didn't catch you doing it at all. Maybe I've <laughs> yeah. just not noticed. Maybe not, not yet, no, but um, I'm getting better <laughs> at not doing it. <laughs> but, you know, these little bits and pieces. Uh, that, so I spend like four hours on a Sunday. And you know, Sunday, I've been, you know, Friday, I've been doing whatever. And then Saturday, I chill with my girlfriend and we normally go out and do stuff because we, we're quite... Um, we're quite active. We're always doing something. We're going to, you know, people always tell me, they're like, my friends say even watching me is actually exhausting because I'm just always doing stuff. And that's the problem with liking everything is, you know, I want to watch, go to the cinema and watch movies while also watching Game of Thrones and TV series. But I love Star Wars. So I want to watch a Star Wars YouTuber for two hours, but I want to play Guitar Hero with my girlfriend. And it's like, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Um, finding time to do all these things. And podcasting takes a huge amount of time out of that because i try and post on social media every night so more people can find me and hear people like you talk who you know my job is just finding people that are more interesting than me and trying to have a conversation with them and shine a spotlight on them and it's like it sounds like a douchey thing to say but like i would love to be have be famous from podcasting not so i could be famous but so when i meet people who are really talented and cool i'd actually have some sort of weight behind me you know like joe rogan if you if joe rogan you know coughs and it sounds like your name your twitter followers will go up by like a hundred thousand overnight you know he's got that power and like i've got friends who you know i've got other uh, my friend wayne who started a podcast recently called ignite the flame audio that's really cool um he's an author and um, his podcast is reading a chapter from his book each time and then afterwards he does tips of the trade and some background information on the like what he was thinking his inspiration little easter eggs and things like that it's a really cool way for him to release his book to people who don't want to spend money buying a physical copy or digital copy of the book and he like he's so talented and he's way more talented and interesting than i am so it's like i want him to come to the podcast and for people to come and see him and then kind of give him love and i would just love to have a podcast where i could say you're awesome no one knows about you come my show more people will know about you and it will help you to live out your dream in a sense and in doing so i can have my dream which is just traveling around england and just you know i would like to be able to say chat with you for two hours release that as one podcast and then next week have another two hour long conversation release that and have i i don't have time to, to be able to I'd have to record an episode with someone every single week and it's so much time and effort and things that goes into all these things and it's like my it's a passion project if at the end of the however long I mean I've been doing it now two yeah two years I think almost yeah it's end of August it's September now isn't it yeah two years I've been doing this and the the biggest thing for me is meeting cool people you know like you and like golf the guys in comics in motion like a lot of the podcasters i've met that i've got friends in london now who we're planning on we're going up to london me and um, a girlfriend for uh she's supposed to go to this lecture thing she's a teacher uh she's a languages teacher yeah that's what you mentioned yeah yeah so it, you know um we want to go up there to this conference thing and then we're going to see these guys but i met them through podcasting and it's even if i stopped tomorrow i would still have met all these cool people and having a podcast has changed my experience of life, how I talk to people, how I process information. You know, you said um, before we were recording, you've listened to some of the earlier ones that I did. Well, some of the earlier ones I noticed, especially because the earlier ones are primarily with my friends and things, is Mm -hmm. I talk a much higher percentage of the time than I actually want to, which sounds weird, but sometimes I will just get verbal diarrhea. And while talking, I'll think of like 10 other things to say. And I want to try and say these interesting things and have a conversation about them but i also don't want to forget them but i do want to hear what the other person has to say but i I get wrapped up in it far too much and i'm getting far far better at it now of just saying okay i can i can pause here i can let someone else talk but it's just passion it it, the reason i do this is because i love doing it and even at the days that i'm just like 
fuck, I don't want to spend four hours editing on the Sunday. But if I get, if I give myself the exception of that one Sunday, it will start to keep happening. And then it won't be as consistent. And then my chances from, you know, of making it big or succeeding or getting more followers or whatever, that will go from being very slim to almost none. And it, right. And that's kind of how I, I appreciate anyone as a passion, especially when it's not something that's necessarily going to give you financial gain in immediate terms. You're just like, I want to do this. It's actually going to cost me money and time to do this thing, but it adds to my own life experience so much that I'm going to do that. And that's what I really appreciate about you. That's what I get from hearing about your thesis. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it is, that is all true. You know, going to college to study anything, Mm. it costs you money um, unless you are on a full scholarship and you're, you know, some magic, amazing athlete or musician who gets a full ride scholarship somewhere. Um, That's true. And you do that again because you want to learn something. You want to be better at something. Uh, yeah. So for me, the book, I, you know, I, could I have done it? Like I said, I don't. I don't think I would have. I think I would have fitzed and started it like I had before. Get oh, I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to work real hard, and I'm going to write these ten pages. Oh, I wrote ten pages today. Yeah, I'm good for the year. <laughs> you know, and that's not okay. I mean, when this process started, so I'm in. I'm I'm almost done. Um, I, I'll finish in May of 2020. So that means I started in June of 18. And in June of 18, I had maybe 20, 30 pages of this book. And I've got 250 pages now. And I know how it's going to end. Um, you know, I'm not writing it as much as I would like to right now because I'm in the, you know, when you're in class, you're writing other things and you're reading other things. And then I've got to do my job to, you know, grade papers or whatever. So I don't write as much on it as I would like to, but I definitely, but I have that that muscle memory now that if, even if it's just once a week, if I can work on the book once a week and I can get five or six pages written, that's good. There's a young adult writer called Scott Westerfeld, whom I love. Um, he wrote a book called Afterworlds, which is about this woman, this girl writing a book. And then every other chapter is the chapter that she's writing. Right. Okay. So it's like she's writing the book and then you're understanding her process and then you get to read the book she's oh, writing. I it's see. Fascinating. That's genius. It is really good. He's, he's great. But in that book, he says, the character says, um, like her character wrote the whole novel during National Novel Writing Month, which is November. And so she's like giving a speech about that. And she says, well, that's unusual. And this is the best advice. And I try my best to stick with it. And I don't. And I fall off, but I want to keep doing it. If you write one page a day for a year, at the end of the year, you have a novel. Yeah. And that's more, that's longer than most novels are. Most yeah. novels are not 365 pages. No, exactly. And it's- so it's like that idea of being in this program is definitely good for my job. It's helped me be, you know, as an instructor, it's going to look good for my university. There's all kinds of good things there. But, you know, I'm going to have this book when it's done. I hope that 15 people read it and say, that was fun. <laughs> um, you know, the friend of mine whose daughter is a film producer is convinced She's not even read it. She just knows the plot, but she is convinced that's going to be a movie because she's always thinking in movie terms because that's what her daughter makes films. So she's always thinking about like, oh, this you'll be at the you'll have to take a year off to go to the film premiere. Like, <laughs> let's come down. Um, I mean, I, th- I would be I would be silly to say I haven't thought it. I haven't looked at my wife and I was like, oh, you know who would be good as this person? And I'd yeah. say it, and she's like, ah, she's too old, or oh, she's too young, or that wouldn't work, you know, whatever. So um, I'm like, oh. So I'd be silly. That's what you do. I mean, you, you, like you said, Oh, wouldn't it be great if I had Joe Rogan numbers? Oh, Um, I've I've dreams of being interviewed on Joe Rogan and him like that is, I was daydreaming about that today in my car. I was just driving. I was like, well, if Joe Rogan had me on a podcast, could I talk to him for three hours and say interesting? I don't think I'm interesting enough to do that, but I'd love to. (laughs) Sure. But that's what you're saying. You know, it's like, um, you know, you think like Mark Maron who kind of made the whole podcasting thing a Mm. thing. Um, You know, he did it because he didn't have any other jobs, you know, he only started his podcast because he, he couldn't work. He was angry. He was drunk. He started recording twice a week. He hired a producer. That's what you need. You need a producer. You need to be able to hand your stuff off to someone and be like, here's the stuff. I'll do this stuff. You do that stuff. You know, but you, you know, that'd be the goal. If I, if I could make money, if I make money, if I don't even even start a Patreon or anything. I'm I, just well, that's the, the thing. I think you should, I, I don't know what it costs to start a Patreon. I'm assuming it it's free. It doesn't cost anything. Yeah, it's, it's free to start. And some people have said to me, you should start it. But it's like, to start it, to get people to give me money, just to give me money, I feel like I should give them more content. And it's like, I, I, I want to give people that content. But without going into super depths of my numbers, my numbers aren't high enough for 
me to re- like if everyone who listened gave me the equivalent of one british pound a week that's still less than i earn and that's still less mm. than i would need to actually you know i would obviously i wouldn't just quit my job tomorrow if i had have many hundreds on patreon you know what i mean but it's like i don't i don't want to do too early and then stretch myself too out too thinly and be like oh god i need to do a patreon thing once a month or once a week whatever and then also stress when i've got you know out of everyone who listens i value every listener and i'm really appreciative but even if you said you know five percent of everyone who's listening would actually pay money for it mm-hmm. that the, the amount of people that is although i'm sure they would really love it it's like um, I, do, I can't at the moment warrant running myself ragged for a collective yeah. of people. Especially, that's if, you know, I've seen Patreon pages of podcasts that are bigger than mine and they start Patreon and they're like, yeah, we get thousands of listens per episode. I'll do a Patreon. And then they do it and then they've got like four patrons. And it's like they have to, then they've already committed to saying, I'm going to release an episode every week of an hour long. And I already release an episode of an hour long and I'm doing it for four people. And it's like, that's for some people that's fine but i i'm a very busy guy and this is currently a passion passion project but once i get if i get big enough to really warrant like i told you i did speak about it uh, you probably noticed in some of the podcasts a few months ago i mentioned it at the end of podcast saying think about doing patreon i'm not sure but then i kind of i've leaned off that for now so I don't sure. know. well the one thing and then i'm gonna need to go because in, in about yeah five i minutes, know your I time to go start making uh dinner so i work from home and my wife works in the world so i'm, <laughs> the, I'm the cook so when she gets home i like to have dinner ready and stuff because yeah just to be around people and i don't unless i choose to so um I, you know and i like cooking i'm the vegetarian um so it's easier if i cook but um <laughs> the one thing you know you could do and again just spitballing is if you did the Patreon, because you generally, most of your shows... Oh, sorry about that. I hope that didn't come up. My computer virus thing just oh, made I didn't noise. hear anything, no? Oh, good. Um, most, most, uh, you know, most of your shows are two hours long. If you, and if you're recording one once a week and then you're using that, you know, and then if you're still recording once a week and then you're turning that into two-hour shows, if you do one, edit it down to one hour and then do a bonus episode on Patreon. So if you like, mm. if you liked what you heard, there's an extra hour with this person that's on Patreon. So you're creating two shows by only doing it once a week. I have thought about that, um, which it's, it's a fair idea, but I have also heard the counter, because I'm in a lot of podcasts, I, I won't sure. take up much more of your time, so this could no, be a no, real quick fine. thing, but um, I'm in a lot of pa- podcasting groups of oh. varying size and things, and they all say the biggest bugbear is when people start putting things, extra content, uh, they put... The, the kind of idea of it is almost uh, downloadable content for like video games. You can basically give someone a full product and then say, you pay extra, you get additions to that. Or you can say, here's half the product, you can pay to get the rest of it. And for me, I find that a lot of my podcast, the second part is actually often a lot better, especially when it's someone mm. I don't know that well, because the gears get oiled. And by the end of it, people are less like, oh crap, I'm being recorded. Everything I'm going to say is going to be online forever, blah. Sure. It's more like... Oh, there's, I'm just chatting with this dude and some people. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. I I mean, again, it's not a friend of mine and I have talked about, um, she's finishing up her doctorate and I'm finishing up my MFA. So we talked about, because there's not a lot of education ones. We were like, I was thinking you should do a podcast. Yeah. And we talk, like she and I talk maybe once a month, probably not as much, probably not that much. We text a lot, you know, like here's something stupid. But when we talk, (laughs) we'll talk for like an hour about nerdy education stuff. Um, and so our thought was, well, we'll just do a, you know, talk and teach in with Beck and Tony and, and we'll just have our normal conversation and we'll just record it. Um, and we'd make that a thing. So we've talked about it and whether we will or not, I mean, she's getting more interested in it, but she's also, as we're speaking, defending her uh, thesis uh, proposal. So she is not really willing to, um, to do a new project while she's got, <laughs> you know, pre-teens and writing a doctorate. So yeah, it's something we had considered and we'll see. I mean, I've got a lot going on and you know, like you said, you don't want, I don't want to do something crappy and I wouldn't want to do something that takes away from the writing or takes away from any of the other um, stuff that I'm doing either. You know, that stuff is important. To yeah too, so. well i was gonna say um i'll wrap up now but i would just say yeah. um uh, two quick things what first of all if you do start a podcast uh you can come on here promote it and if you want any sure. advice or help uh starting a podcast i would appreciate that I, yeah. I helped my mate the one i mentioned earlier uh yeah. ignite the audio i basically helped him start a podcast completely nice. so um and then the other thing was um i will say with podcasting uh with the patreon thing it's 
it's more I if you no matter I want to clarify no matter what you said at that point if you, every model I've kind of thought of uh of sure, podcasting sure. and I've kind of half I can see yes and no for every single one of them and in all honesty it's it's not even the way I go about it it's just me at the moment so sure. I do appreciate the input that way but I just want to clarify yeah no no I understand like I said yeah. I've, I've you know I listen to podcasts I've been on this is the third one I've been on it twice it was on comics and well, Motion, come so. on next year and we'll yeah, have a nerdy sure. chat we'll that talk would be all great. About comics and all that sort of crazy stuff but yeah 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 I would it's love been, that well, it's been absolutely incredible to chat with you for so long Thanks. and you've been very generous with your time. And uh, yeah, well, we'll def- I'll definitely have you on again and we'll just chat about nerdy stuff and that's what sort of Sure. Technically, this was educational nerdy stuff, which is also yeah. cool. But we'll talk yeah, about just I appreciate yeah, that. other stuff. But yeah, thank you so much, Tony. It's, it's been great. Thanks. You're, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And that's the end of the podcast. Thanks as always for tuning in, guys. Um, obviously, if you liked anything that Tony had to say, be sure to find him on social media. Um, I believe he's on Twitter at Tricycle Boombox. Um, there's a link in the description, so be sure to check that out. Um, I think I'm going to be having him on the show again at some point next year, probably just to talk about nerdy stuff like comics and that sort of uh, stuff, because he sent me a, a couple of uh, PDFs of some comics that he's uh, been collecting and stuff. So I've been reading them. So well, I'm just going to start reading them shortly. So I want to read them, chat with him about that and some of his favorites of authors and things but that won't be until next year so um just put that on a pause for now um coming up um i've got a chat due with a individual who is he hosts a a true crime podcast essentially um we were going to record it last week or this week, whatever, and then um, we had to reschedule. Um, so that's going to be in a week or two. Um, I'm also chatting with another podcaster on Saturday, um, so the day before I normally release an episode. Um, and that will be um, about, I think, sort of, it's going to be about a wide variety of things, but sort of uh, drug abuse, uh, sort of teenage lives, uh, caring for parents, divorce, like there's loads of darker sort of thing so i think that's what we're going to be chatting about i imagine i'll release that episode next week um i've got three due to be recorded before i go to italy at the end of the month um i believe when i go to italy i'm not sure i'll be releasing an episode that week so maybe another gap there or maybe i'll do a solo pod i don't know uh we'll see how that all goes um but yeah, for now, I'm, I'm hopefully recording three new episodes. I'm hoping at least one of them will be a two-parter, and then that'll take me to uh, November, and then I've got a few more um, due to be recorded in November too. Um, I don't think I'm going to do a Christmas one this year. I haven't figured it out. I might do. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I am at the moment. Um, normally, I'm quite ahead with podcasting and things like that, but I've just been so busy with everything in life. You know, I'm still catching up from, you know, when I went to Mexico and moving house and I just got my tattoo finished. So be sure to follow me on Instagram and you'll see a photo of that soon. Um because I've been talking about it for a little while, because I got like most of it done, and then I uh, there's a little bit of a break before I got it all finished. But now I've got two fin- fully finished tattoos on my arm from Star Wars, so now there's space for three more. Then I have my whole sleeve done. So exciting stuff for me, and mainly only me, unless you're a big Star Wars nerd like I am. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm hoping to do some collaborations, be on some other people's shows and stuff as well in the run up to Christmas, or at least one or two other people's. Um, I think my guesting on the Brave Files is probably going to be in the next couple of weeks. That should probably air soon, so be sure to look out for that. It's more me talking about my sort of dad and how that shaped me. Obviously, any listeners of the show should know that um, my dad passed away when I was 19, and I talk about it a fair amount because it's obviously quite a big thing that happened to me, and I, I call it like an anchor point in my life. Uh, it was a point that really changed who I sort of was in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, I talk about that. If you're interested in that, you can go back to episode... Oh God, I should have really thought of this. Uh, I think it's between episode 30 and 40 or so. It's it's around that sort of region. It's called, the episode's called like Remembering Dad. So if you go back, it was released on Father's Day of 2018. Uh, so that'll give like a, obviously I released like one a week. So you just go back far enough, you'll find it. Um, yeah, uh, following on social media is super important. Uh, well, it's not that important. I mean, as in like, if you can follow me on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, like posts, share them, things like that. You know, I don't spend any money on advertising. So sharing via word of mouth or sharing on your individual social media pages, even if you have like five people follow you, like I do really appreciate it. Uh, and as I always say, you know, um, if this is your first time listening, thanks for listening, especially this far. The second part, I normally just like this outro bit. I normally just kind of ramble on until I kind of get sick of hearing my own voice. Um, but I was going to say is... 
if this is your first time listening, uh, go back and check out the back catalogue because if you enjoyed this chat, you know, Tony's an incredibly interesting guest and I have had a huge amount of other interesting guests of a wide variety of things. Um, I've had a paleontologist on, my friend Wayne. Uh, I've got the Science But Simple episodes, um, which are with my friend Josh talking about how sort of uh, science of everyday objects and things you know talk about how light bulbs work how the sun and the moon works and tides and all sorts of things like that we talk about misconceptions like quite a wide berth of things i'm hoping to get another one done and then maybe before christmas um and then you know there's also other episodes about education i've had a blind filmmaker on called goff he's australian yeah he's blind and he makes movies um he's been on the show twice i had bill m of the church of satan on the podcast um so and we spoke about the misconceptions surrounding the church so anyone who's interested in religion that church of satan one's really really interesting we do talk about general religion religion as well as the church of satan but the to clarify the church of satan is an atheist group like they don't worship satan they don't even believe that satan is a real thing so you know I like to try and have these conversations with people that I find interesting and things that help uh, debunk misconceptions, essentially. I, I, I want I want things to be clear, I guess. I want things to be honest, honest and open conversations. So that's my kind of jam. Um, but yeah, look for the back catalogue. Um, if not very many people listen on YouTube, but on YouTube I organise things into playlists. So if you go in there, there's like a playlist for funny chats, which are ones that are just kind of a laugh and aren't necessarily that serious. There's ones about movies. There's ones with entrepreneurs. There's ones about, um, I think religion and social uh, issues and things like that. So I've kind of, I think it's like seven or eight playlists I've kind of put them into and I try and make sure each new episode gets put into that. So if you don't want to listen on YouTube, which is fine because barely anyone does, uh, if you go on YouTube, uh, find Genuine Chit Chat. Um, it should be fairly easy to find and just type in this episode title, I guess, and it will come up. Um, and just check out the playlists on the channel and then it will have them on there and then you can kind of figure out what you want because, you know, this is the, I think it's like the 100th episode now or something. It's like, it's like number 71, but it's like the 100th thing I've uploaded essentially because um, obviously a lot of the episodes I do are part one and part two. So I've been going now, yeah, 100 uh, releases. So it's like 100 weeks of releasing things. So there are quite a lot of episodes out there. So, you know, go on YouTube to find that out. Anyway, I'm going to stop rambling now because I'm going on for ages. Uh, Thanks as always for listening, guys. I appreciate each and every one of you listening and sharing and all the sort of glorious things you usually do. Uh, And hopefully I'll talk to all of you next week.